as we talk about prayer, I have been so overwhelmed and just consumed with revelation that the Lord has given as a result of prayer and fasting this week. I've come to understand what Lamentations 3 means when it says that his mercies are new every morning. There's a revelation waiting for you as you get close to him. How do we get close to him? We get close to him through prayer. We get close to him through communing with him. And of course, prayer is is a powerful tool all by itself. But you talk about supercharged prayer. And that's what's going to happen when you begin to press in in even greater ways. And last week, we started talking a little bit more in depth about what prayer and fasting can do. Prayer and fasting. And one of the things that we understood as we got into the subject a little bit is that this is something that we've not really talked much about, and it's something that we have really, in the American church, not embraced over the past 100 so years, probably, in the American church, like they embraced it in the scripture, and like they embraced it even in the early church. Prayer and fasting went together. When you got serious about praying, you also fasted. We talked about this last week, and we talked about some of the ways that you can be involved in fasting. And I wanted to read for you today in just a little follow-up as to where we were last week about some reasons why it's a very biblical thing, it's a scriptural thing, to get involved in fasting. And one of the reasons that we're talking about this is if there was ever a time when we need it needed a real supercharged prayer life that came as a result of fasting, it would be now. We need to get the power turned on. And I, I want to just give you a little example, and, and we have kind of talked about this some, but I saw a story this week, and it reminded me about the fact that our local energy company, whether you have DPNL or AENS or some other local provider, that company supplies your home with everything you need to run all the things that you have that require electricity. And this last week, when we were in Grace Folks talking about some of the things that have been changes over a majority of those folks' lives over the past 80, 90 years, there have been lots of changes. One of those things is the total proliferation of electricity. Everything is electrical now. And of course, everything's computerized. And if you're not such a techie person and you're not such a geek, maybe you have a hard time seeing how all these things work. Well, just think of the change that happened when everything that used to be manual and by hand all of a sudden became electrified. Now we're dependent on the delivery of electricity. So let's say you turned off all the lights in your home and you were sitting in the dark. Now, I've been in this sanctuary before when the lights all went out. And you think, oh my goodness, we need to do something. Somebody needs to turn the lights on really quick. If you were in your home sitting in the dark, wouldn't it be foolish to call the electric company and ask them to give you more power? You're sitting in the dark and you call the electric company and say, hey, something's wrong. You all need to send me more power because I'm in the dark. All the power you need has already been made available to you. Instead, what you would need to do as you're sitting there in the dark is access that power that's already coming into your house. It's already in your power lines. You need to flip on the switch and that opens the flow for the power to come on in. Now, what would happen if you called the electric company and told them that all of your lights were off and you needed them to come over to your house and turn them on for you. 
How many of you think you'd get a, a visitor from DPNL? <laughs> you know you wouldn't. Most likely they would not come because their job is simply to supply the power. Not to turn your lights on and off. It's your responsibility. You have to access the power that's flowing and that's available to you. I guess you know where I'm going with this. In the spiritual realm, as you fast and pray, it's like by your obedience and faith that cause you to get involved in those things, that's what flips the switch to access the power that God has already made available to you. Are you following me? <laughs> I know it's a silly story. And we, we look at some things like that and we think, oh, isn't that silly? Well, how many of us, though, don't access the spiritual power that we need and that same mindset is at work. We're thinking, well, you know, God needs to show up and give me more power. No, that's not the answer. The answer is you need to use what he's already given you and you need to do something that's gonna flip the switch. And flipping the switch is gonna happen when you get involved in a powerful prayer life. So fasting supercharges the prayer life. And it's one of those things that gets your focus where it's supposed to be. So I want us to look at just a couple biblical examples today. And we're going to start by reading from the prophet Joel. And Joel in the Old Testament, chapter 2, is where I want to read a few verses. And this is really an amazing passage of scripture because in this passage of scripture God gives a command that the people of God were supposed to be involved in fasting and the prophet Joel was to announce that God's will was that they would be involved in coming to him with all their heart and fasting and we discovered last week that what fasting does, whether you decide to fast one meal, whether you're going to fast something that your flesh has gotten dependent on or, you know, kind of give up something that you know you're in the habit of getting and you're going to kind of turn that down in deference to something that God wants to do to kind of get control of your habits your thought processes, the things you crave, and it allows God to become your focus instead of that other thing you're going to fast. Many people have understood that what Jesus did, and we talked about this uh, last week and the week before as he began his earthly ministry and really kicked his ministry into high gear, he was involved in a fast. And then he was also tested by Satan. Now understand that as you decide to do something that denies your flesh, like fasting, there are going to be visits from the enemy who would love to discourage you and talk you out of using the power that's yours. But God has put the power in you. Don't let Satan talk you out of using it. Don't let anybody else talk you out of it or be used as a tool of Satan to say, well, you know, you probably can't do that. You're too old to do that. You like to eat too much to do that. <laughs> you don't have the self-control to do something like that. Don't let the enemy talk you out of it. If God has burdened you for giving up something so that he can get a greater position in your life and become a greater focus, don't let anybody talk you out of it, especially the enemy. So in the Old Testament, God is showing us in the early years as he spoke through his prophets that fasting is a thing that he desires us to be involved in. I know it's not something that we've talked about. I know you've probably not been pushed by any pastor or even had the opportunity to really seriously consider this. But one of the things that we've got to consider if we're talking about serious prayer is fasting. 
because this is what really ramps up the capacity to get close in communion with God. So with Joel chapter two, starting with verse seven, I want us to just get hold of these prophecies because this is a prophetic passage. This is talking about what God wanted to do in the people at the time of the writing of this, this prof prophetic utterance in Joel. But at the same time, this is looking forward. It's a prophecy about some things to come. It's as though the Lord looked down the road and could see us in 2024 and says to the people at First Grace, listen, this is what I'm declaring to you today. The days are coming to a close. The days are short before I come back. There's going to be a lot of things ramped up against you. You're going to have to make a difference in your culture. There's a crisis moment in the work of the Lord. There's a crisis moment as people need the Lord. And here's what I want you to do to face this, starting with verse seven. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. So blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Listen, this is a word for America right now. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. And here in this prophecy, rain is a type, it's a symbol of the Holy Spirit being poured out. Early rain, and he has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain, the vat shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The hopper, talking about the grasshopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never again be put to shame. This is a prophecy for us today. I want you to understand today that when the prophet Joel is saying to the people of God, and here they're referred to as the people of Zion, obviously it was given to the Israelites originally, but those who name the name of the Lord Jesus right now are God's people. Prophet Joel is saying, listen, I want you to call for a fast, a solemn assembly. I want you to get serious about your prayer life. I want you to get serious about coming together corporately and touching heaven. I want you to pray for revival. I want you to pray for protection. This applies to every aspect of who you are, down to the youngest among you, up to the oldest and most experienced among you. I'm calling a fast, and I'm calling you to come close to God. God will be your deliverer. He will be your support. He will deliver you from pestilence. He will deliver you from the enemy, the evil destroyer, 
and we know from the New Testament that that is who Satan is. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He is the destroyer. God says, how do you get deliverance from the enemy? And the answer is, get serious about your prayer life. Declare a fast. Press in. Come to God. Don't give up. Press in. And the Bible promises that you will never be put to shame. There might be some people that say, well, you know, eventually, those folks over at First Grace, they've dealt with some stuff, and they're going to eventually give up. Well, guess what? They don't know our God. Nobody's given up. There may be a whole bunch of liberal, wicked elements in our culture today that say, I wish those conservatives and those people, those evangelical Christians and those people who stand for godly principles, I wish that those people would just give up because they ought to know that they can't win. Well, guess what? I've read the back of the book and we do win. And we're not giving up. We're gonna stay strong and God will empower us if we'll do what he says. Now, we've got those if and kinds of equations in the scripture. Like, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then God says, I will hear from heaven. So there are some things that are responsibilities for us and some things we have to step up and do. But listen, we, re we remember from last week that fasting puts the power in prayer. It supercharges our engines in prayer and like nothing else can. But since there are so many misconceptions about what fasting really is, we've had to kind of talk through what this whole thing is all about. And you remember, fasting prepares our spirit and our soul. Fasting is not a spiritual hunger strike. And we talked about this last week. You know, it's not getting all dynamic about fasting because you want to drop a whole bunch of weight. Now, that might be a byproduct of what you do, but that's not the purpose of why we enter into fasting. It's not to be seen by people. It's not to show how spiritually elite we are. It's not to give some sort of a, of a picture to somebody else that we're just so, so together with God and this is what we're doing and we kind of lord it over people by saying, well, this is what I'm involved in and if you're not doing this, you kind of feel some condemnation about it. Listen, this is something that God has to move on each one of our hearts about. And I'll just tell you this last week, I fasted every day. And it gave me a tremendous amount of resolve and clarity and strength and focus and all of these things that we talk about when we say it supercharges our prayer life. But in no way does my decision having to do with that mean that every person that hears my voice and is living close to me has to do it as well. God has to burden each one of our hearts for this. And as we come into a place where we're able to apply this to our lives, and you know, you've got to pray about it. And you have to consider how much you can take on. Maybe even consult a doctor before you, you step into this at your next appointment and say, you know, I'd, I'd really like to do some fasting because I want to ramp up my prayer life. Maybe it'll give you a chance to witness to your doctor. But let them know what you're contemplating. And I'll just tell you right now, the physical results will be positive, but the prayer results will be off the chart because your focus changes. Prayer and fasting isn't starving yourself until you get what you want from God. It's not some sort of a, a temper tantrum to try to get the attention of God, but it's letting him know that you're, you're ready to 
let go of some things because you want him to fill every part of your life. Fasting is not a way to manipulate God into action. God cannot be somehow deceived or forced to do what you want him to do. Prayer and fasting is more than just having a prayer answered or a need met. It's the change of your prayer paradigm. This shift from here to here. From what I want and all the things that I'm involved in and all my habits and all my desires and all my drives over to everything that's him. Prayer and fasting is about becoming spiritually focused to align ourselves with God's will. And this is what we saw in Matthew 6. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what Jesus told his disciples to pray. So the idea is that fasting takes us to this place where we get in alignment and we say, God, your kingdom come, your will be done. I want us to look at just a couple biblical accounts, some stories from the word, where fasting was employed in addition to prayer. And these are practical examples. Some things that we need to look at today because we face these very same kinds of scenarios where fasting is really necessary. It could be a resource in a time where you have felt like you're just treading water. You're not really finding the power in your prayer life that you really thought that maybe you could. You're not experiencing all the promise and all of the presence of God in your prayer life like you thought you would. Somebody needs to flip the switch and get the power on. So I told you the example here. This is what these folks in the scripture discovered as they employed fasting and God moved mightily. And I, I want you to be armed with these things. I don't want anybody here to feel like, well, the pastor's encouraging us to do a bunch of stuff, but he's not telling us how to do it. We don't have any examples of what we're supposed to do and how it really makes a difference. Why should I fast? Why should I go through all these things? Well, for the same reason that you want to do anything that's commanded in the scripture. First of all, God said to do it. Second of all, it will strengthen you and it'll give you a resource. And, and third of all, you're gonna be transformed by employing that resource. It's time to turn on the power. So number one, if you've got something to write with, this would be a good time to write it down. Number one is fasting during transitions. I don't think it's any news to anybody here that this church has been in a transition over the past year. So people, people's agendas, things rising and falling, certain people wanting this, certain people wanting that, you know, differences about what they wanna see in a church, what kinds of things are driving their desire to be part of a church. You know, we would love to see people that are driven to closeness with God by getting into the word and really plugging in to spiritual things. There are a lot of other people who want to see programs. They want to see all kinds of entertaining things. There are, there are a bunch of agendas out there. But listen, whatever brings on the transition, transitions are part of life. This goes with changes. Changes because of times of life. Changes because of stages of life. Age. All kinds of things. Transitions. And as we fast during difficult transitions, God has the capacity to give us wisdom to carry us through the difficulty. So here, difficult transitions are part of life. And 
no matter who you are today, no matter what age you are, and no matter what kind of life you've had, transitions are coming, they're going to be difficult, and as you fast during difficult transitions, you get illumination for the answer that's on the way. So 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12. This story talks about the people of Israel. They had just come through the first reign of their king. And as you recall, the first king that was crowned in Israel was named Saul. It wasn't because the people really needed a king and God wanted to be their king. But they pushed because everybody around them had a human king. So they pushed and they pushed and they pushed and they pushed and they grumbled and they complained. Finally, God said, okay, here's your king. And he spoke to the nation through a prophet that had the anointing of God in his life and he would speak into that king and he would speak into the people. But they would get their human king and the first king that they got was named Saul. In 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12, we read that the end of Saul's reign had come to pass. And the people were now in a transition because Saul was going to be gone. They had put so much faith and trust and hope in this human being. He was tall, he was handsome, he was involved in leading them into battle and winning. He had all of these things that he brought to the table. God wanted to be all those things for the people, but they put their hope and trust in Saul. When Saul passed away, the people were beside themselves, and they mourned, and they wept, and listen, they fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord, and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. Now you know that the next king that was going to be coronated was David the shepherd boy. And he became king over Israel. But there was a massive transition. And this transition was happening in Israel. There was a passing of the baton to the next leader. This happens all the time. We're in a transition this year as a nation. Hopefully there will be another transfer of peace power in a peaceful way. But there will be a transition. There will be a transition from one administration to another administration. We have transitions like this always happening. In our family, as family grows, there are transitions from different places to other places. We've got all of these things happening. In Israel, they fasted because in a transition, you feel insecure. Things are changing. Saul, the king of Israel, and his son Jonathan had just died. Not just the king, but his son. David, the one that was called to be the next king of Israel, had long been anointed as king, but had not been installed as king yet. That's why there was a transition here. It was time for him to take the throne. David called for this fast because he knew he needed to hear from God during his time of transition. So he led the people in humbling themselves before God to help them through this time that was on top of them. There were enemies rising up against them. They needed God's protection. The beginning of the year was a perfect transitional time. And it is for us. We're only in February. We're in the second month of a new year. A perfect time to fast and pray that God will take us from one point to the next, from an old year into the new year, that God will take us from the place we used to be as a church to the place that he wants us to go as a church. Transitions in your marriages, transitions in your families, transitions in your work. What does God look for? He's looking for you to get serious in your prayer life, to fast and say, God, 
bring it on. I'm ready for the new thing that you've got. But in the transition, it's really important that we set our focus on him, that he's first in our lives. God loves it when we give him first place in everything. Not an afterthought. Not, oh God, by the way, I did this and this and this and this and this. Will you bless me? No, nope, not that. Not, God, I have entered into this thing and this thing and this thing. I made this choice and I did this thing. Will you just make it all just perfect? I need your favor right now. No, God is saying, turn to him first. Fast and pray. And then you'll know it's his will that's being done and not yours. Fasting during a transition. It's really important. Number two, another story out of the Old Testament. Number two is fasting in times of desperation. And I'm sure that there are people here who have had desperate times. You got into the place where you just don't think you can handle it anymore. You're th through the roof feeling difficulties and pain and frustration and feeling continually like you're under assault and you're being attacked. And I'll just tell you right now that desperation is another one of those life lessons, sort of like transitions. There are going to be times when things are absolutely out of your control and you can't do anything about it. And this is the place that the apostle Paul talked about when he said, in my weakness, when I'm out of control, that's when he's strong. If we can fast and pray, deny ourselves something of life, some passion of our life, and press in, put him first, and get our prayer ramped up and supercharged and turn the power on, God says in times of desperation, we're gonna get an answer. He's gonna show us a way. And you've heard us sing the song, God will make a way when there seems to be no way. I love that song. I love that song. Because he makes a way, especially when we're feeling desperation. It's like, God, do something. God, quick. I, I remember as a kid feeling desperate right before that school exam, you know, right before the test. And I, I used to pray for God to come. I'd say, how about the rapture? <laughs> right away, Lord. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Hey, I'll tell you, that may seem trivial now, but to a kid, desperation comes in that form. For an adult, desperation is another form. Whatever stage of life we're in, as we are desperate, it's a perfect time to press in. Esther, Queen Esther. Esther chapter four, verse 16, talks about the dilemma that Esther faced. And we look at Esther as the one who saved her people. And this is how it happened. It's because she pressed in, she prayed, she fasted when there was no other hope and she was completely in a state of desperation. Esther chapter four, verse 16. It says, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days. So this is a a specific fast that God was asking Esther to be involved in. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. This would be a complete fast. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king. Esther's talking here. I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. 
She's fasting because she's desperate. She's fasting because she's up against a wall. If she doesn't go to the king, her people will be annihilated. In times of desperation for our nation, sometimes we need to step up and do these kinds of things. I don't know of another hope that's going to pull America through this year. It's nice to know from Scripture that Esther was facing a similar thing. Her people were going to be annihilated. There was no way that they could continue if the situation would go forward the way that it was going. So God gave her a revelation and said, what I want you to do is start with a three-day fast. I don't want you to eat or drink for three days. And what he was saying was, this is not a hunger, starvation kind of a fast, but I want you to press in. I want you to fast for the purpose of focusing so totally on me day and night that you'll know unequivocally that the answer for your people and the nation came from me. I want you to do that. And then go to the king. Of course, she understood that if she went to the king without an appointment, without permission, without his blessing, that it was the penalty of death like that. She obviously was asking God to go before her. She was asking for the favor of God in her life. So as we look at these things, whatever the desperation, you may be wanting to press in to pray for our nation. You may be wanting to press in and pray for the ministries of first grace. There may be things having to do with your family. There may be things that you're struggling with right now that you're feeling desperate about. Listen, the example here is that if you'll pray and fast, if you'll get your focus on God, he will give you his favor in your situation. He turns the hearts of kings. He deals with people from the inside out. We can't change what anybody's feeling or what they're thinking, but God can. Anyone who tried to approach the king in Esther's day without first being asked to do it would be certain death. No one was permitted to speak to the king unless they were invited to come into his presence. Aren't you glad God's not like that? He wants us to come running into his presence. He loves you to come and see him. So Esther, dealing with this system, she sent word out that she was going to go to the king at the peril of her own life. She didn't know how she was going to get through it. She was desperate. She knew she could die, and she was resolved in her heart. If I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. He could take my life. She had a lot of courage. This is one of the reasons that so many women revere Esther. She did marry a pagan king, and that wasn't the best. But I'll tell you, she had a lot of courage, and she saved her people. Because she knew her life was on the line, she fasted. But she didn't do it alone. She also asked all of her people, all the ones that she hung out with, Everybody that was around her to fast because she knew that they desperately needed God to move. So when you're in a desperate situation and you need God's favor, what do you do? Fast. Fast. When we fast, we declare that we can't do what we intend in our hearts to do unless God is going to help. We can't get done the things that God really wants us to push through unless he's there. We're not capable on our own. Let me, let me remind you what Zechariah, another prophet, Zechariah 4 verse 6 says, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Why does fasting and prayer turn on the power? It's because the Spirit of God within us is the spiritual electricity. Release it by prayer and fasting. 
So do you understand all of this? The spiritual electricity, the thing that is energizing you, empowering you, and giving you capacity, as you turn it on, it's the Spirit of God working through you. Wow. Instead of DPNL, it's GPNL, God power and light. Number three is fasting for future destiny. Fasting for future destiny. And I want you to turn to Nehemiah chapter one for this story. And this is a great story as well. Nehemiah chapter one, verse three and four. And I'm talking about future destiny. And of course we know Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future, a destiny. That's Jeremiah 29, 11. How does he get that done? Well, often it's because we haven't prayed and really pressed in, prayed and fasted, and really appropriated this resource and flipped the switch so that the power would be manifested and the favor of God would be on our lives. And we don't realize our great destiny. We don't realize the destiny spiritually that God has for us because we've not flipped that switch. In Nehemiah chapter one, it says, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The exile here is referring to Israel being exiled from their land. Israel, Jerusalem, the temple, all had been destroyed, all had been torn down. The walls around the city had been destroyed. The people of Israel, and specifically the prime young men of Israel, had been taken into Babylon, into captivity, as punishment that God allowed because of their disobedience and their idol worship. So for 70 years, it had been prophesied that they would be in exile. In that time, there was a remnant that remained in the nation of Israel. All of their greatest resources had been taken away to Babylon. The people in Babylon heard that there was a remnant in Israel still struggling. They wanted to rebuild Jerusalem. They wanted to rebuild the temple. And so those resources, those Israelite people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, many, many others that were bright, shining lights from the Jewish people were there looking for ways that they could somehow go home and rebuild. Nehemiah was one of them. And he heard that the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I, Nehemiah, heard those words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And guess what happened next? And I continued by fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He knew Jerusalem's walls needed to be rebuilt. He knew the city needed to be restored. He knew that they were coming back into that place and that they were going to have to rebuild. All of these things were things that God had revealed to him, but he was praying and fasting to get himself in a place that they could actually accomplish what God wanted to do. And I said, O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant, and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. So Nehemiah cried out to the Lord, he fasted and he prayed. Ezra was the prophet that would speak into this situation. He and Nehemiah headed this effort to bring the people back after 70 years to entreat the leaders of Babylon to ask them for help, to look to them for cues that they could maybe go back and do something to help this situation. They had built relationships over 70 years of exile. And there were people there in Babylon, 
And we're talking today about modern day Iran. It's always been a struggle. There's always been conflict there. But at that time, the people of Persia were open to seeing Israel go back and rebuild. Now the Ayatollahs would like to wipe them off the face of the map and destroy them again. But at this time, they were open. God moved in the hearts of the king. God moved in the hearts of the leadership of Babylon. As a result, a prayer, and yes, a fasting. You need to see a change? Fast for it. Pray and fast. This is what happens because destiny can change because God is the one who moves the hearts of kings. So Ezra, the prophet, was there and knew that there needed to be some sort of miracle from heaven. And in Ezra, the book of Ezra, chapter 8, verse 23, it says, So we fasted and implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. Ezra was fasting. Nehemiah was over in Babylon, and he was fasting. They were fasting and praying. They were on the same page, fasting in unity, so God would give them a great destiny. Then in chapter 9 of Ezra, verses 5 through 9, or 5 and 9, it says, At the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting, says Ezra the prophet, with my garment and my cloak torn, and I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And he said, God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. How many of you know that was a miracle. There's no way that that could have happened apart from God moving heaven and earth as a result of being entreated by prayer and fasting. The exiled Israelites were released after 70 years. Also, as a result of fasting and praying. Of course, we know that Daniel was over there. He was praying. He was a prayer warrior. He even got thrown into the lion's den because he refused to stop praying every day. Shadmach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace because they refused to stop praying. They would pray. They would worship their God. They would fast. They would press in for communion with God every day. Multiple times a day, Daniel was at his window praying morning, noon, and night. This is what released them from captivity. And it had been prophesied 70 years was what they would have in captivity in Babylon. And at the end of 70 years, they were permitted to go back to Israel. But their land was in ruins. Ezra and Nehemiah led them back home. These men who had fasted and prayed. They had fasted for a future destiny that they couldn't see humanly, but God had it ready for them. They began rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. And there were many adversaries to them rebuilding. At one point, they had a brick in one hand and they had a weapon, a sword, in their other hand because they were busy fighting off adversaries that wanted to stop them from the supernatural godly destiny that was planned for them. And see, sometimes we have to take it on. We have to take on the defense of what God has given to us. And by prayer and fasting, if we get a solution and God sh shares with us that he wants us to move on to our destiny, don't let anybody try to talk you out of it. Don't let the enemy talk you out of it. And as we've talked about these things, we will get supernatural intervention, but there will always be an enemy that will try to steal it from you. Your destiny is tied up with what God wants. And no demon of hell should be able to talk you out of it. 
these people began rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. Ezra's job was to bring back spiritual life to God's people. And I've talked to you about the fact that they stood all day long and heard the word of God. Just like we've done here, as Ezra started reading the Holy Scriptures, the people would stand in reverence, sometimes as long as 8, 10, 12 hours, morning, noon, and night, and were amazed at what God had to say. They were in awe of God, and God had delivered them. The people had completely forgotten God's law and the Scriptures Ezra found those scrolls that contained God's word and read it aloud, and the people were astounded. They tore their robes in shame and repentance because they had not lived according to God's expectations, and suddenly they realized why they had been put into exile in Babylon. God's punishment had led them there. But it didn't take away their destiny, not even that. Ezra proclaimed a fast to get everything back on track. You might say, well, Pastor Bruce, why have you been talking about prayer and fasting for the last six weeks? Same reason. I'm proclaiming these things to get us back on track. (laughs) So here's, here's what Ezra did. And we're looking at this thing and we're saying, okay, so what are you going to do? Ezra proclaimed a fast and asked for God's protection as they prepared for their future. So where are we going? Are we just flailing around? Are we like a a herd of sheep that everybody's kind of going their own way and we don't know where we're going? No. This is the reason why we're praying. This is why we're fasting. That's the reason why we're doing this at the beginning of the year. Because God wants us to know where we're going. And so Pastor Bruce has taken the role of Ezra the prophet. And we're declaring prayer and fasting so that we know where our destiny is. And as we start growing, as God starts moving, as we start seeing miracle intervention, nobody's going to be standing around saying, well, what in the world's going on? We'll say, of course This is what God told us to do. Hallelujah. Somebody might even get shouting and jumping in here. So when you're preparing for the future, fast and pray. Fast and pray. Your destiny's at stake. So the last one, fasting in spiritual warfare. Fasting in spiritual warfare. And we've touched on this in previous weeks. But I want to give you just a couple passages. One story out of the New Testament here. Matthew chapter 17. And I want us to read 19 through 21. Most manuscripts include verse 21. There are some that have got it in italics. And it's not necessarily um, accepted in every translation, but this enlightenment is important for our discussion today, and I want us to hear it. Matthew 17, starting with verse 19. So the disciples had encountered this demon-possessed boy. And they had been told by Jesus that they had authority over demons. And they came back to Jesus after they had been given this authority and they said, Jesus, even the demons obey us. They come out of people as we cast them out in your name. Jesus said, amazing, that's great. And I'm telling you, you have authority to do these kinds of things. So as the disciples came across this demon-possessed boy, They tried to cast the demon out of him, and the the demon was absolutely out of control in this child, causing the child to do all kinds of crazy things and, you know, try to kill himself. And the father was concerned, and he was the one that came to Jesus' disciples and said, is there anything you can do? And they tried, and they tried, and they tried, and they tried, and they tried. This demon would not come out. 
So they came to Jesus and said, now we've discovered this situation and we don't understand what has happened. Why can we not cast out this demon? Jesus stepped up to the plate and of course, you know, there's a great answer here. Jesus is God. And anything that you do in the name of Jesus can succeed. But you have to have that hotline to heaven or else it's not gonna succeed. If you try to do it in your own strength, if you try to do it in your own name, if you try to do it in your own power, you may or may not have success. In the name of Jesus, you will always have success. Jesus stepped up being fully God and the demons of hell recognized who he was every time. There, there was no doubt in their mind, no confusion in a demon's mind about who Jesus was when he arrived on the scene and they knew he was God. Jesus rebuked the demon, listen, and it came out of him. And the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples, you know, in all their bewilderment, you know, trying to figure out, well, why couldn't we do that? They came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, this kind never comes out except by prayer and fasting. So this was his encouragement to them. Now Jesus had an awesome prayer life himself, but he was encouraging them that the power is flipped on for whatever you need by prayer and fasting. So you've got the Holy Spirit in you. He will not come out and do his job until you flip the switch. You ask in the name of Jesus. You appropriate the power. You're ready by faith to see what God wants to have done. And that faith, that flipping of the switch allows prayer and fasting to empower what needs to happen. We pray hard, we fast, that gets our focus, our meditation, our complete attention in the right place. That's what fasting does. And I know that some of you have got this mental picture in your mind, fasting means I don't get food. And you have to change your mindset. Fasting means that your attention is on God and God alone. You're thinking about what's first, first things first, and it can't be food or any other thing. You can fast from all kinds of other things. Maybe fast from TV, that would help you a lot. Maybe fast from your diet of news and other garbage. Maybe fast from, you know, you know, your addiction to soap operas or your addiction to, you know, whatever it is. You know, th those kinds of things. You can fast all kinds of things. Jesus is talking about getting your focus on, G on God alone and his plan. So he's telling them that they couldn't deliver the boy because they were not spiritually prepared. That's why he said that. This one would only come out with prayer and fasting. You have to ramp up your power level to deal with this one because this one is firmly entrenched and is not ready to go. Now, when Jesus was on the scene, no problem because he was God. But he instructed the disciples, and this is why this happened and why it's included in this gospel account. Because Jesus wanted us to know that there are going to be situations we face. It might not be just like this one, but there are going to be other situations that are unique to you that you'll never get through until you pray and fast for it. You won't have the power unless you step up and flip the switch. you got to do it. So... They needed, the disciples needed to defeat the enemy. We need to defeat the enemy. And the enemy wanted to keep the disciples from receiving the promises that God had for them. He's the same enemy and he wants to keep you from the destiny God's promised you. 
He wants to keep you from having victory over him. He will lie and cheat and deceive. He's got all kinds of things to keep you distracted and to keep you discouraged and to keep you depressed. Those are all tools of the enemy. Don't let him use those things. Step up, get your paradigm shifted, and trust the Lord. Prayer and fasting, it'll take you right to the place of focus you need to be. God says we call on him and he answers us. It's that simple. He'll give you perspective. He said he would rescue us if we seek him. As believers, we can pray and fast and literally alter the course of the plans of the devil. Listen, 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. You want to thwart the devil's plans in our nation, in our elections, in relationships, in whatever situation you're facing, you can change the devil's plans by stepping up, flipping the switch, and getting prayer and fasting to literally change the course of what the enemy had planned. God's got a plan that's better. We call that spiritual warfare. So we're going to replace the plans that the enemy had with the plan of God. God has given us many promises that are conditional. We talked about this earlier. If you'll, then I will. That's what God says. If you'll step up by faith, trust me. If you'll step up by faith, enter into this situation with prayer and fasting. I will bring deliverance. All of these things, the devil currently has dominion in our world, and that's a bummer. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, Satan got dominion in this world. But we can push back. His reign of chaos is going to reign in this world until God's people will pray and fast and humble themselves. That's where it all lies. So the dominion of the enemy will continue to rule and reign until we get serious and step up and humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from our wicked ways and then God will hear from heaven. We can push back the gates of hell. And that's what Jesus said the purpose of the church is. That he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. We push back hell in this world. I don't know how effective we've been at doing it thus far. But I do know we need to grow some more in this area. And the church of Jesus Christ, the remnant, and maybe it's a remnant this size right now that can do the work and maybe do the heavy lifting for all of the watered down, ineffective churches out there. We need to push back the gates of hell by doing what the word says. And that is going to involve us in spiritual warfare. We'll get the victory. We'll win. How do we do it? Humble ourselves. And then we can turn the course of history with prayer and fasting. Think about that. Want to change the course of history? (laughs) Hey, God is not interested, you know, in how large a throng we are. One of the greatest battle stories in all of the scripture is the story of Gideon. Where tens of thousands were whittled down to 300 men. And they went up against one of the mightiest armies on the face of the planet and they won. They were small but they were powerful. They didn't have what the world would say were the makings of a great army that could defeat anything. But God said, I will use the remnant. Step up and fight. 
pray. And listen, it doesn't require a lot of physical prowess on our part. If we can humble ourselves, pray, fast, God says, I'll empower you for anything. So Ephesians 6.12 says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we're wrestling against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. This is one of the ways that the scripture describes what we're dealing with in our world today. Oh, we know we've got a big spiritual stronghold in Washington, D.C. And we know that there are spiritual strongholds on the right coast and the left coast. We know that there are all kinds of principalities and powers and wickedness and evil that are prevailing in regional areas over our nation. And this is one of the things that Frank Peretti wrote about in his, in his series of books called This Present Darkness. We understand that there are principalities and that there are rulers and authorities spiritually that are under the prince of the power of the air, the one who has dominion over this world right now. But everything that's good that is happening in the world, everything that's righteous and holy and restorative and all kinds of help and strength and right things going on, are because God's people are pushing back the gates of hell. That's what the battle is. The Holy Spirit is empowering us for that battle. And listen, we've quoted this ever since COVID around here, and we quoted it a lot. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So we're not afraid of any kind of confrontation with the enemy. His days are numbered. He's toast. God will be victorious. Back to the story of Daniel in Babylon. He was in a desperate situation. He fasted and prayed. We know about his prayer. But listen, one time he fasted for 21 days. He ate no food. He denied himself any food that brought his flesh pleasure. For 21 days, we're talking about three weeks. On the last day of the fast, Daniel had a vision of an angel. And some believe that this vision was actually a vision of Jesus because it says the angel of the Lord. And he got this vision and it had a message. The message told Daniel that on the first day of the fast, he had actually been on his way to answer Daniel's prayer when he was confronted with the prince of Persia. Hmm. I think maybe that prince is still over there. But listen, whether it was Jesus or whether it was the archangel, there was an angel that appeared to Daniel and said, on the first day of your fast, I was coming to answer your prayer. I was on my way to fulfill the things you were praying for. That's how ready God was to answer. But he encountered opposition and for 21 days, he fought with a demonic stronghold or some kind of principality that was over that area of the world. Can you imagine? Daniel had full vision of this and understood it was prophetic. Throughout the scriptures, demons and demonic strongholds are referred to as princes or principalities. That angel in that prophecy told Daniel that he had been fighting that principality for 21 days. How many of you know, if you were in that battle for two hours, you'd have been knocked down. But I'll tell you, we've got the angels of heaven. Jesus himself will fight for you. There is no demonic stronghold. There is no power of wickedness or any principality that can possibly stem the tide of God's, God's strength and his wrath. Paul said we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. So the things that you're fighting, this is the reason why prayer and fasting is important. You can't see them. Doesn't mean they're not real. Most of the real things of this life are things we don't see. 
that power that we talked about that you turn the switch on and the lights go on, you can't see it. But you're awfully glad it's in your lines, right? You know, a lot of these things you can't see, but it doesn't negate the power. So Jesus is saying, when we fast and pray in spiritual warfare, we're wrestling with the enemy. And sometimes, you know, we have to really take it on. And he told the disciples, sometimes these can't be removed without serious prayer and fasting. It happened in Daniel's case, and Daniel didn't even have to do anything. He just prayed, and the forces of heaven fought for him. Hallelujah. We need to be praying that the forces of heaven will fight for this ministry. And we need to be praying it every day. God, send your angels. Speak into the lives of people in Butler Township. Speak into the hearts of people in Vandalia. Draw them by your spirit. Father, I'm praying that you will do battle on behalf of the ministry. Pray that God will do battle on behalf of your pastor for people and ministries that are going out of this church. Pray that God will fight for us. Pray and fast. Let me just say, <laughs> this is not going to be easy. But even while we were dead in trespasses and sin, and we were following the course of this world before we knew Jesus, we were following the prince of the power of the air. We were children of Satan before we were children of God. Now the spirit that is now at work in our lives is greater than anything we face in this world. The greater one is in you. Greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. You might say, who, who is it that I'm serving? Who is it that I'm praying will come and intervene? The greater one. The one who is greater than your issues. The one who is greater than Satan. The one who is greater than all of the bad memories in your past. The one who is greater than all of our baggage and all of our stuff and all the things that have gotten us down. The greater one is in you now. So one day, a man was given a special gift. He was given a cruise. He had never been on a cruise ship before. So he was really excited to take his very first voyage. The cruise came at no cost to him. And the person who gave it to him picked up the entire tab. Ho, oh, ho, ho, hallelujah. I need to believe for that. Throughout the week on the cruise, one of the crew members noticed that the man frequently ate all the free food that was up on the deck. Free crackers, and they had little glasses of juice provided on the deck. In fact... He had never seen anyone eat as many crackers and drink as much juice as that man did. Curious as to the reason why, the crew member spoke to the man as he was disembarking at the end of the cruise. And he said, sir, how did, how did you enjoy your cruise? The man replied, it was spectacular. I've never experienced anything like it before. The crew member said, well, very good, sir. And then he continued, I noticed that you really like the crackers and the juice that we made available on the deck. I, I was just wondering, why? Well, the man replied, looking down, I saw all of the lavish meals that were being offered all week long, but I, I didn't have any money for that. And since the crackers and juice were free, I let them sustain me during the cruise. The crew member replied, someone didn't give you all the information. When the price of your ticket was paid 
it not only included getting on the boat and going everywhere the boat goes, but also it included everything on the boat as well. Your food was covered in the price of the ticket. You get where I'm going now? Kind of like the crew member said, I think somebody didn't give you all the information. So the reason I'm telling you these things today is because I want you to have all the information. Jesus paid for your ticket. As we look at this spiritually, we understand our faith in Christ, our salvation not only takes us to heaven, I mean, and that's a cruise right there, but it also provides us with everything we need on the journey. You get the good stuff because it's all been paid for. I want you to know today, you have access to all the best stuff. The heavenly diet. You got it all. All the things you need. And we access these things by flipping the switch and turning on the power through prayer and fasting. We can have everything that we need. Jesus already paid for all this to be done. The point is, we have to first get on the boat. And then secondly, take advantage of what Jesus is offering. Receive the gift. Get the free food. For heaven's sakes, don't be on the cruise and eat only crackers. Get the good stuff. God's got the best for you today. And I, I just want you to know, I love you, and I want you to have all the information that's going to bless you on the journey. I mean, just look at those stories. Look at how the people who turned to God had every need met and found their destiny in God's will.